If you have any interest in your pet's nutrition, raw feeding, your pet's overall health, you need this video is gold because I am interviewing in this video the one and only Rodney Habib. I urge everybody should out, they should do out there because you know the lower the blood sugars, the research and science shows you'll actually increase longevity and you'll actually prevent like cancers and diseases. Try it. It doesn't hurt. Chop up the vegetables the way you want to do them. Juice them, puree them, add them to the food, and test your dog's blood sugars. There's your easiest way to validate. There you go. I love it. I love it. And again, it's more attainable, right? Like, are you saying that it's maybe ideally better to puree, but if you can only just chop, it's still almost as good? Is that kind of what you're saying? I think there's a, probably a combination of, of both there. There's a happy okay. spot. I would love to know. If, listen, if any scientist or anybody's watching this, yeah. I would love to know the happy spot okay. myself. I do know that when we juice things, and there was a lot of people in the industry when everyone was on this big giant juice kick, yes. um, where people are juicing vegetables and then pouring sort of the, the juice vegetables on top of the dog food for full absorption. I agree, but then the issue is you just remove the fiber. Yeah, and when no. you take out the fiber, it's like drinking orange juice. You drink orange juice, you're going to get a massive spike in your body of your blood sugars, and your body's going to start churning out a lot of insulin. Yeah. Eat the whole orange with the fiber. Mm -hmm. It's a slow release, yes, a, a, a minimal spike of blood sugars and a slow release of insulin. So to answer that question, where is your happy medium, full nutrient absorption or high blood sugars, maybe do a combination of both. Maybe on some days you juice for full nutrient value, but on other days to keep the blood sugars low, you keep them in a, in a sort of finely chopped position. Okay. It's a great debate. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And then real quick, so you, you showed me kale, you showed fish oil, and I know, but what are like two or three more um, foods yeah. that you'd like so to add in? Yeah, there, there's there's some really good food hacks out there if you're trying to, I mean, of course, you know, there's going to be two different people that are going to be watching this. You've right. got your fresh food feeders, you've got your home prep, and you've got your uh, sort of your kibble processed food and canned feeders. So we'll just, you know, we'll address this for, for each category uh, on the amount of time we have. But if right. we address it to the, the big population, the 96% who are the processed food feeders, there are some things that you can add into that bowl that can make uh, the kibble way better. Okay. And, you know, I've done a million zillion blogs on these. Yes. One of my favorite all-time studies, of course, we talk about vegetables all the time. There's a study that I recently posted uh, talking about just broccoli, the sulforaphane in broccoli and osteosarcoma in canines. Again, I love science. But this, you know, this study showed very quickly that just adding a little bit of um, uh, uh, broccoli from sprout, you know, actually, this is actually really cool. Okay. Um Sulfurophane and broccoli is, of course, the study was based on a lot of sulfurophane. The criticism is going to be, well, you'd have to put a head of broccoli in there. Well, just a little bit of broccoli over a long-term accumulative effect, you see benefits. But if you're chasing sulfurophane, how about sprouted, how about uh, uh, broccoli sprouts? Broccoli sprouts yeah. You can go to your local farmer's market. It's like a dollar for a giant bag. Yeah. And just adding like sprouts into the food, that sulfurophane is unbelievable. But if you're, again, to talk to people in rescues and shelters on budgets, um, there's some herbalists or uh, at farmers markets, or you can order these things bulk online. They're so cheap. Um, alfalfa, organic alfalfa. Okay. And I so alfalfa is packed with micronutrients, yeah. and not a lot of people realize that. And so um, you can buy alfalfa fresh. You can get it dried. A big giant jar of this, like so. This is here in Canada. Um, this thing came in at like three dollars and ninety nine cents for this big giant jar. That's like a dollar American because the, our dollar is so terrible here. But literally, you can actually get that way cheaper in giant bulk. So you can go here in Canada. We have like these big giant bulk barns where people can go and get yeah. herbs. Of course, if you can buy things organic, of course, they're going to be better. But do what you can afford. Um, wheatgrass. Okay. Wheatgrass is a big one, right? And yeah. so a lot of these green powders, um, you don't really need a lot. They're full of like micronutrients. They're like big. So they're pretty dark and green in there. I'm going to make a giant mess don't on my it. keyboard <laughs> to show you. Oh, right? yeah. But see so yeah, how the emerald. richness yeah. and the greenness in there? Yeah. Anything that um, can come from uh, things that are aquatic have beautiful trace minerals that you're not going to be able to get. When I interviewed like the world famous Steve Brown, who's like mm -hmm. one of the top formulators in the world, I love this guy. I asked him, how could you make kibble and things better? Um, <clears throat> I got my little, little shoes here. Hi, come say hello. <laughs> the little, little shoes here is, is all the stuff that I'm throwing behind me down there, crunching away up the tubes. I was gonna, she, I was, actually, I'm not going to carry. She just took off. But oh, anyways, okay. see, she'll, she'll be zooming in and out of here. She's got her oh. bone that she's chewing on behind me. Sardines. Yes, sardines. Yes, yes. I yes. love sardines. Sardines are not only are packed with omega three, but they have a giant nutrient profile of things that are aquatic in there under the sea that are that are great. Um, and my favorite 
Now, I'm not sure in the U.S., but I know in some places around the world, mussels. Yep. Yeah, mussels yeah. are probably the most complete food source that you can add into your dog or cat's diet. You just have to put like one or two a day mm-hmm. if you can. Maybe a couple times a week you can afford it. A big giant bag of mussels is five bucks here in Nova Scotia. I'm not sure how much it is in other places. I guess it would have to depend on the country. Yeah. But you really can uh, you really can enhance food with uh, little things uh, like that, like little tiny food hacks, sardines, mussels, okay. things that are aquatic. Of course. Yes. Of probiotic. course. Yeah. I this is kefir. Yep. This is coconut kefir, 300 billion lipobiotic enzymes. What's really fascinating, Rachel, is the fact that um, I flew all the way to London and I talked to Dr. Tim Spector, and he's uh, according to Reuters magazine uh, one of the one percent of the most cited scientists in the world. And the biggest question I asked is if if you had to give me one thing for longevity that would literally increase the lifespan um, of a human or an animal. He said it would have to be your gut biome. Yes. And he said the diver- the diversity in that belly for your animal, for yourself, that they found that the people that had more diversity in their belly lived the longest. Yes. So you can go to your local farmer's market and pick up a bottle like this. Like we usually get these giant bottles here in, in Nova Scotia for like two or three bucks. Mm-hmm. They can literally last a couple months in the refrigerator. All you need is a couple of teaspoons. I've done a couple of blogs on it. There's probably about yep. a million blogs out there in the exact dosages of these things. Raw goat milk? Yep, goat's milk. That's what, when I get the malnourished puppies, they get that goat's milk. Raw goat milk is unbelievable. Now, this is frozen, so you can buy it, you can freeze it yourself, and yeah. you know, you can use it within four days. Um, so, your farmer's market is probably the biggest treasure base for anybody that's in a shelter or anyone home for getting things at an excellent deal, making. Uh, Making friends with a farmer, buying things on bulk and freezing things or drying things or whatever you have to do. Uh, these are small food hacks that would really cost you very, very inexpensive things, but would have monumental benefits to adding on top of your food uh, to help increase longevity and prevent diseases. Yeah, and this is one reason I look up to you so much because you keep talking about um, these local markets and these, these farmers markets because I'm I personally eat mostly plant based. I don't really eat a lot of meat, and when I do. It's from local sources, just that's right. another topic. But um, I think that you're spot on with the farmer's markets because here in Texas, they're year round because of our weather. It's always hot right. and warm. Um, right. And I think you're absolutely right. You can get, you know, locally sourced, organic, humanely raised meat, and then obviously the vegetables. So that's incredible to me that you're also preaching that. Because I think that's extremely important as well. Yeah, and you know, we, we you know, we we, we sh- uh, you know, I showed a bunch of things here that you can add. But of course, first and foremost, and I've got examples, and the big one is of course adding these uh, raw, fresh foods yeah. into the diet. So a lot of these things that I've been showing you here are very, very inexpensive things. Um, but to go back. One of the biggest reasons why people don't want to take the plunge on like sort of like a raw fresh food diet, of course, is money. It's a massive issue for people. And so we do have hacks there as well. Of course, what's speaking with the Finnish scientists, it was the same thing, that even if you had a good, well-balanced source of like a raw food, adding 20% into a diet um, is very impactful by just adding like a little bit of raw into a bowl of process, you could lower disease markers. But what's the problem? For a lot of the people, for a giant portion of the people, we know today that the big consumer is the female. In fact, it's a 96% driven, the pet food industry is 96% driven by females. It was my mother that fed me, God love her, from a Mediterranean household, not my dad, although I love my dad, a hardworking, a blue-collared man. But it normally, nine times out of ten, I know the culture is shifting very quickly now because of Generation Z and the millennials, but it is a female-driven industry. And that word raw food freaks people out, right? Yep. You say the word raw food, what are you thinking? You're thinking blood, you're thinking guts, you're thinking, no, thank you, I'm not adding any of that in my bowl. But a lot of people haven't seen it. That's probably the thing that shocks me the most. So today, like, you know, they make these foods now to be so convenient for people. Now, this is by no means, this is any sort of product endorsement. I do want to say that right now. I just went. I'll even hide the bags and I'll flip them the other way. But reality is, you know, going to pet stores, just local pet stores and seeing what local pet stores in here, you know, so you'll see that big word like raw on the top there. Again, I do want to stress I'm not promoting any of these products. Uh, just trying to show examples. You know, today they make them to look just like kibble. Yeah. Rea- there it is right there, right? Yeah. Reality is this is what you're looking at when it comes to uh, 
processed foods. Yeah, that's and so it's not area. really that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, there's no blood. There's no guts. Literally, you, these things are now made to be so convenient. You just chuck them in a bowl, 30 seconds, thaws out, ready to serve, right? Um, another really good example is right here. over here. You can get them now shaped like little medallions. Yeah, right? little sliders, little, sometimes they call them. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like little tiny shapes, like little tiny burgers and things like that. Yeah. And again, if I crack one of these open, um, they're not really that scary looking of things. Like, look, there it is. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, right? that's what we started feeding because I was overwhelmed by, since I don't eat a lot of meat, I was overwhelmed by the, the bones and then getting the organ meats and the, the regular, so that stuff, not necessarily that brand, but um, kind of the pre-prepared. Uh, of course, yeah. yeah. It, you know, the, that is kind of the big thing for people. You know, balancing is important. Yeah. Let me start off by saying that. I, you know, it wasn't until that I started meeting really cool people and scientists. Like, this is a really cool thing that Steve Brown really leveled me on. And this is showing a comparison between a wild duck and a domesticated duck. So there would be your values mm -hmm. there for, like, your copper and your iron and your manganese. And then over here, there would be your values for a domesticated duck. Now, there's a big, giant difference. Yeah. So if you were buying wild duck for manganese, you were getting, like, 0 0.9 milligrams. And if you were buying... Uh, a, uh, that's a wild duck, a domesticated duck, you were getting like 0 0.4. To, my, to not make things so technical, I knew that, the, that buying wild ducks eventually, after I stopped buying domesticated animals, I realized that at that time, I thought that because it was wild, my dogs were getting enough nutrition. And so I think, again, one of the biggest, scariest things for people out there that don't want to take that plunge into fresh food, can I do it wrong? You can do it wrong. There's a term that a lot of people use that is – it's it's balance over time. You'll hear a lot of raw feeders say that. Yeah. And I agree with a lot of people that if you can remember what you were feeding your dog and you can rem and you know what you need to give your animal, um, then that could work. But that term balance over time, a lot of people really stick to feeding their animals the same things. And dogs, it takes forever to see a nutritional deficiency in an animal. And so dogs are very resilient. In fact, the – uh, Oscar, the longest fasted dog in the world, went 110 days without food, and he was still jumping fences at 110 days without food. Yeah. So it can show you how resilient an animal, an animal can be. But for me, I was lacking on manganese, and so if you if you take a look um, at today the statistics, here's this is this is kind of hilarious here. This is sort of the AFPO guidelines. Again, you can get these online mm -hmm. and over on, 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 on this side. So this is AFCO versus Ancestral. I know this is really hard to be flashing these on a webcam and no, probably a million people are going to be like, versus... I'm going to kill you. But you <laughs> could probably flash, you could probably flash an image in on the screen and you're very clever that way. But that being said, ancestrally, it said there that when an animal was eating ancestrally in the wild, they were getting 3.1 milligrams. That's what I thought my dog was getting because I thought I was feeding ancestrally. Now, AFCO, there's a lot of criticism, but at least they give us some minimums. And here they'll tell you that you need 1.3 milligrams of manganese. Right. Well, how does the average pet parent know that? A, they don't. Yeah. B, I was feeding my foods and I wasn't analyzing my food. So I was going out, I was going to the farmer's market, I was buying these wild animals, and I said, well, my dogs are getting absolutely everything they need. The mistakes I made was my dogs weren't getting enough manganese. In fact, when I analyzed the meats, they were coming in 10 times lower than the average requirements that dogs needed. Manganese is super important for joint development. My dog ended up blowing both of their knee, uh, her, both of her knees because I wasn't balancing properly. So these were some of the mistakes that I made as a early raw feeder that I try to promote today whether I'm lecturing around the world talking to people so they don't kind of make the same mistakes. Um, here's what's really, last but not least, when if you are let's say feeding hardcore raw, which there's a limited amount of people, where does all the manganese come from? These are Dr. Karen Becker slides and Steve Brown, by the way. Thank you for lending me these. If you look all the way down here, you'll see that all the manganese, lambs, wool, uh, feathers, and the hair. So unless you're feeding, and I wasn't feeding my animals feathers and hair and fur, you're missing out on the things that you need in a diet. So I think one of the, the biggest things that I can tell people who are just getting into this new is support a good ethical company that you know that's done all the balancing, that you know that has gone through the rigorous uh, work of talking to food scientists and getting things to be balanced um, because it'll save you a lot. I think that's key. That's amazing. And 
ah, uh, I just feel like I have a million, million things I'd love to rack your brain on, but I know we're getting up on time. And I, I don't want to go until we kind of talk very briefly about your cancer documentary series because you have put your heart and soul into that. And I just want anybody watching this to to know that you've created what 10, 10 hours total. We yeah, it, it's a combi. So the, there is a combination package right now because we we merged up with a, a, another fellow creator. Um, who was filming a documentary at the same time. Uh, his name was Ty Bollinger from The Truth yes. About Cancer. And when he found out we were filming one, we found out he was filming one. We were like, why don't we just merge these together since all we want to do is point people into the right direction. Right. And just if somebody supports you, then give them theirs yours for free. And if yeah. somebody supports us, uh, we'll give them yours for free. And so uh, the combination of both is ten and a, half, uh, a little over 10 and a half hours yeah. uh, with, with the cancer documentary. We... So to, to answer, yeah, to answer today and is the epidemic of cancer. And every single pet owner is going to have to go through it. Why? They say the statistic today is one in 1.65 dogs, yeah. that out of any mammal in the world, the dog is getting the most cancer. Uh, and cats. One in, one in three cats, although veterinarians today in the trenches will tell you it's one in two cats, a lot of it goes undiagnosed because we go into our vet and there's this big giant mass and the cat is like literally dying there on the spot and nobody's going to dish out the thousand dollars to send off blood work to find out exactly why their animal died. Let's be honest. So a lot of this stuff goes uh, sort of undocumented. When you get that call, you're not only are you devastated, but you're scared. The first thing is you're like, how much time do I have? And then what are my treatment options? So you're given either a cup burn or poison, which is going to be chemotherapy, radiation, um, or surgery. And then you start jumping out into the world trying to figure out what on earth you can do. I had all of this background, all of this knowledge from working with all of these years uh, with some of these top scientists and doctors in the world, and my dog still got cancer. And if it could happen to me, doing all the things that I knew, I knew that it was going to happen to a lot of people. Yeah. So I refused to, to sort of let my dog go, sort of fade away the way that uh, the diagnosis had looked. So I traveled the world talking to the top experts, the top scientists in the world, trying to figure out what was the best way to go after cancer, non-toxic, that pet owners can do at home. Some of us don't have money. $16 billion is going to be spent on veterinary care this year, uh, cancer veterinary care. So for those people out there that don't have these monies and these funds, they don't realize the things and the mistakes that they're making at home that, had, that could fuel these cancers. So we filmed a documentary to try to help every single pet parent on this planet not fall into the same mistakes that a lot of people are doing. I love it. That's incredible. And I will have all of that linked below so that people can access that and go support you and what you're doing. Ah, so much. Thank you so much. I, those are all the questions that I have for today, though. Um, again, I can't thank you enough for your time and just what you're doing for all the pet parents and the dogs out there. It's it's incredible. You know, it was awesome talking to you. Um, I know that I probably I'm going to I'm going to take 30 more seconds because I know yes. I'm going to get a lot of heat on this uh -oh. about. Uh, this was a big one for a lot of people that say, uh, you know, big, a lot of emails that I get all the time is I want to feed raw, but I can't afford it. What are some more affordable ways for me to be able to feed the raw food? And you may already know this. There's a lot of science behind this. But what people aren't aware of is when they go into box stores and they go to buy foods, when you buy a little fancy bags like I was showing you and kind of like little medallions like this, yeah, it costs money. Yes. And those of us that have big dogs, we can't afford that. Literally, if you buy this food, it comes in at $6 a pound. What a lot of people need to start asking for out there, this is a raw food hack. Here is a statistic published by the um, G, uh, GFK. And these guys are always uh, – their statistics are just unbelievable. I, I got this from the petfoodindustry.com. Check this out. Here are your ways to buy raw food. And so right here in the middle of the frozen raw food, we know that stores today um, – it says here, uh, shop, shop selling around 53% of just traditional raw foods, which would be bags like this. Here, this giant rising statistic on the side. Do you see that word there, Rachel? It says chub. chub. Yeah. So 57% of shop owners are now selling. It's actually passing. It's actually passing sales like this is buying food in bulk. The problem is not a lot of retailers carry things like this. So you as a pet owner, you have to go in and just ask the retailer. Again, I'm not supporting this company. But just saying, look at the difference if you buy it in bulk. $3.40 a pound for the exact same meat. I know this one says lamb, but I couldn't find a bag of chicken. But I did the price sourcing versus $6 a pound. It's half price 
if you're willing to cut it yourself. So imagine for those people, let's say out there that do have shelters or somebody that's young and on a budget that wants to add a little bit of raw fresh food into the diet. Well, you can buy bulk meats and you can get a really, really good deal, like literally a half. Or you can go to your farmer's market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at your farmer's markets, I got to show this because that's, I'm a huge fan of quality of meat. I mean, yeah. take a look at this, right? So this is what you're kind of buying. when, And I'm not knocking on anybody. Just right. a huge fan of the farmer's markets. But, you know, look at the quality here and the difference of when your local farmer – if he knows what he's doing and it's balanced and he works with some, with an animal scientist, take a look at sort of the difference in the quality of the food. So, I mean, look at the richness in that. Yeah. And so for my dogs, uh, if I support like my, my local markets and things like that and I buy my foods in bulk, that is a great way to sort of hack into raw spending. There you go. I had to bring that up before we left. No, that is awesome. Thank you so much. And that's helpful to me. Ah, I'm so excited. Okay, well, <laughs> good luck in everything you're doing. If you ever come to Texas, you have to... To tell me because we have to meet in person eventually absolutely and I, I, I hope we do this again and yes. it sucks that you can't come here and help me with the giant mess now that's all over the map and all the food that's everywhere I'm gonna need about three hours to clean up here but it was worth it it was awesome and, and man I wish you nothing but success I'm a big fan of your channel your YouTube channel Thank and you. I know you're doing some awesome things out there for pet parents and especially the shelter dogs and I really really hope that uh, a lot of these people, whoever are watching, uh, will jump on, man, and subscribe to your channel and, and get some of the knowledge that you have to share yourself. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, you have a beautiful day, Rodney. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you Thank later. You. Bye. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. I hope you guys love this video and I hope you love Rodney as much as I do. He is by far my pet nutrition idol. He's creative, he's passionate, he's selfless, he's just, he's an incredible human being. Um, all of his documentary and social media links will be linked down below. Go check him out, go show him some love. Send, tell him that I sent you, Fasaros Fosters sent you his way and um, go show somebody who's trying to make a difference in this world some, some support. Um, and if you love rescue puppies, I mean, if you really love rescue puppies, don't leave this video without giving it the biggest thumbs up. Smash that link button down below. Click subscribe. I hope that you have a beautiful day. Goodbye. Pan out. No, you're... Turn the camera off. Turn, turn, turn the, okay.